Yes lads, you are alright? How are we doing? Welcome back. It's been a while, it's been a while. I had a busy couple of days and of course it ended up being one of the most, not exciting, but one of the most action-packed times to be a Liverpool fan this season, should we say. Um, Cody Gakpo, we'll start there, we'll start there because we are going to encompass everything into one video because we play Brentford tomorrow because it's never ending with the football at the minute it seems. So we're going to start off with Cody Gakpo. Today, as of now, January 1st, Cody Gakpo is a Liverpool player. He signed from PSV Eindhoven in Holland for £37.5 million, potentially rising to about £50 million, give or take. Boss. Boss transfer. In terms of the attack, it's brilliant. The It's probably not what we need right now, Right now, in this very second, it's not what we need. But if you're looking at it from a long-term vision perspective, what Liverpool now have is a clear, concise future plan and succession line, should we say. So right now, Liverpool could play a front three of Salah, Firmino and, for argument's sake, let's say Giotta. They've been here the three longest. So once you get to that point, you've got a 30-year-old Mo Salah, 31-year-old Roberto Firmino and a 26-year-old Jossa. Jossa doesn't really fall into their category. I've just got to put a name there for name's sake. But the succession planning is really good because what you can see now is how it should be done. We've got our next generation of attackers already in the team, already playing regularly for us now. So that when it does come time for Salah and for Firmino to move on, it's a seamless transition. It's not a situation where we've not been prepared for it in any way. We bring someone in, we've got to hope they instantly click, instantly fire, this, that and the other. They'll have been working in this system. I'm looking at the likes of Luis Diaz, Darwin Nunes, Diogo Jota, for a number of years at this point, when they when they go and Cody Gakpo will be just the same. But I do think there's a little bit of a misinterpretation, should I say, of Cody Gakpo's role. What I've seen is a lot of Reds thinking that he's going to come in and pick up where Darwin Nunes is currently lacking in terms of the goal scoring, and he might well do that, but that's not what I'm wanting from him as a primary aim. When I look at Cody Gakpo, I see a fantastic creator, and again, it goes back to the vision of the club. You're now starting to where in the attack in previous years, I've been a bit sort of confused about what the plan is when Mane was getting moved into the middle and then Roberto Firmino was trying to get phased out when we were... It, it was all just a little bit confusing due to injuries and everything. Now I've got... I understand the clear and concise plan. We're clearly asking our left-hand side players, Diaz and Gakpo, to be your creators in the attack, to be the ones who maybe will drop deep to receive the ball, bring it forward with the dribbling ability and while they can shoot both Cody Gakpo and Luis Diaz have a good shot on them their primary aim will be to put balls into the box try and play an incisive through ball and create an, a chance for your goal scorers which is your strikers and your right winger in Mo Salah Mo Salah is a bit of everything Mo Salah can also be the creator although I don't think it's his best role but now you're you're not worrying about maybe Jossa's on the left. Now I'm seeing it as Jossa and Nunes are strikers and strikers only. Their job is to score goals. And whereas in the last iteration of the Klopp team, should we go for 1920, the one that won the, um, the title, you saw the creator in the attack wasn't on the left, it was in the middle. And then you had your two goal scorers out wide. We're having the creator on the left now and your two goal scorers over in the middle and on the right. It's nice to see the plan. But that's what I'm expecting from Gakpo, a creator who can chip in with goals. He's not a fantastic finisher, but he's got a really, really powerful shot. That's what I think the misconstruence and the confusion around Cody Gakpo will be. But I'm really, really excited. I like a lot of what I've seen from him, albeit it's not much. I'm not going to lie to you and say I'm a VC culinary expert or whatever. No, I watched him when he played Arsenal in the Europa League. And I watched, I think I watched one PSV IX game once when there was nothing else on. 
that's about all I've seen of Cody Gakpo but from what I've heard what I've read what I've seen in comps which is not the fa most fantastic sort of basis to build off there's a lot to like there's a lot to appreciate there's a lot to look forward to and you can see why the club went for it but going back to the original point as much as I like him he's not what we need right now we don't need another attack we do and we don't my issue is I said it I've been saying it the club will fix one area and leave the other it's an issue that we've got it's an issue that we've had for a number of years under FSG and this window is no different We've fixed our attack problem. No Jota and Diaz till March. So we were down to three attackers and Roberto Firmino has been injured since the camp in Dubai. So we have been down to two attackers in a front three. So I've had to watch Oxlade Chamberlain and Fabio Carvalho on the wing. Gakpo in the short term is a fix and in the long term has potential. But Cody Gakpo does not solve our main problem at the minute, which was highlighted once again against Leicester. The midfield cannot win a midfield battle at the minute at times it is Thiago versus three and if you were to give me the option obviously I would like us to sign both Gakpo and the midfielder obviously but if you were to put you know gun to me head I have to pick one or the other I probably would have went for a midfielder first because I think you can get away with it slightly more so if you use Fabio as a striker and Roberto Fino as a striker and move Nunes to the left, you've got more chance of getting away with that than what we've got at the minute where we're watching Jordan Henderson be criminally out of form. Harvey Elliott just is not physically strong enough to play in a midfield. Naby Keita, Oxlade Chamberlain, they're ticking time bombs for injuries and selfishly, I actually don't want them to play because we're not benefiting anyone else but them at this point because they're leaving in six months. And Arthur Mello, is he even here? Is he even in Liverpool? I don't know. I don't know. But Cody Gakpo, look forward to him. I don't think he can make Brentford tomorrow because today's a bank holiday. I don't think the work payment will get done in time. So it'll be Wolves at home in the FA Cup on the Saturday, I want to say. The Friday or the Saturday, one of the two. I'm, I'm really excited because I really like what I see. And look... Who doesn't love a, a new Liverpool signing? Who's not going to get a hype for a new Liverpool signing? Cody Gakpo, number 18. Like my favourite ever player, Dirk Kouth. The Dutch winger connection, it lives on. Looking forward to it. But, as I mentioned there, we did play a game after the Cody Gakpo signing. He was there watching it. Wouldn't have been impressed, would he? Liverpool did beat Leicester 2-1. Um, Keenan Dewsbury Hall, of all people, opened up the scoring after four minutes. Before two own goals from Vote Fias. I can't say his name. The Belgian centre back who looks like a B Tech David Louise kicked it in his own net twice for us, and that was all she wrote. That was one of the worst performances I've seen in a long time from Liverpool Football Club, that one, and we won. And whereas in previous years it would fill me with confidence, it doesn't here. We started off so poorly, and it never really got better. We just scored. The midfield was the worst I've seen it under Jurgen Klopp. And I've had to watch midfield to have Kevin Stewart and Marco Grealish as a double pivoting. That midfield was that bad against Leicester. Harvey Elliott, I love the kid. I think he's got such a bright future. I think he's got a career at Liverpool. I think he's got a bright career at Liverpool. His bright career is not at centre mid. He just isn't there physically. And it's affecting his confidence. When Harvey Elliott came in, he was this tricky winger who had the confidence to beat a man, who wasn't bothered about whoever he was up against. He knew, he backed himself. He was confident in taking him on and creating something after beating him. Right now, you're looking at Harvey Elliott, who is so afraid of making the mistake in the midfield that cost us a goal. He's going within himself, he's going inside his shell, should we say, and not trying to be the creative midfielder that he can be. We're seeing him just do the simple things. He'll intercept the pass or he'll recover the ball. And then you'll see a Salah run, you'll see a Nunes run. But Elliot will just go for the safe sideways pass to the DM or Thiago because he doesn't want to give the ball away and risk it because the midfield is the most scrutinised area in our team at the minute. And any mistake that comes from there is going to be amplified times 10. 
And he's not a midfielder at the end of the day. He's not. He's a winger. He's a 10. And putting him in that midfield, I fear now is starting to do more harm than good. I think he just needs to come out for a little bit. Re- like recover, recuperate, figure out what his, what his role is. And maybe even he doesn't go back there because it's just not his job. It's just not his role. We aren't seeing the best Harvey Elliott. And it's a shame because when I said it the other day, Ben Doak, what we're seeing from Ben Doak now, we were seeing even better than that from Harvey Elliott when he first joined. We were seeing even better than that. But because Liverpool Football Club have an issue where we don't buy enough depth, what we end up doing is almost slowly killing off careers of certain young players. So the best example I can use for this is Curtis Jones. Curtis Jones, when he broke through, was an 18-year-old I think he was 18 or 19, he might have even been 17, he broke through in the January of the title winning season with his goal against Everton. And then, you were watching him, you you saw the technical ability, but he he was still a little bit ways off physically. And you were sitting there watching him going, he needs a loan, he needs a loan, get him more football than him, let him bulk up, let him just play more football, he needs more first team football. But the issue we ran into was in that summer, we went, we've got Thiago who's just come in, we've got Henderson, Wijnaldum, Fabinho, Milner, Keita, Ox. Seven on paper. In actuality, Keita played eight games all season, Ox played 10 or 15, Milner was in and out of the team with injury, Thiago got a couple of big injuries, Henderson was out, Fabinho was out, the only one who played every game was Wijnaldum. So what we had to do, and we're seeing this all starting to develop and pattern up, was stop Curtis Jones from going out on loan because we couldn't afford to leave ourselves short-handed in the midfield and end up playing 20-25 games in a poor Liverpool team by standards. And I think that that is very similar to what we're seeing with Harvey Elliott now where he's playing in a poor Liverpool team by standards and he's playing more football at a higher level than he should be at for a position that he's not ready for yet. And I think it there's a real risk it does more harm than good with Elliot because unlike Curtis Jones, you can see it with Harvey. You can see the danger that he possesses. You can see the plan. You can see when he's on it that he's a good player, that the potential and everything is higher than Curtis Jones when he came in. That's something I want to be wary of, but we were just overall shocking against Leicester. Overall shocking. I've spoken on Harvey Elliott. Jordan Henderson was honestly abysmal abysmal and to see websites and to see journalists try and give him the same rating as Thiago absolute joke absolute joke man Jordan Henderson was awful in that first half the thing that summed it up most it's 1-1 we're under a bit of pressure Jordan Henderson's got it in the corner of our half right corner flag our half right in front of the cop He's got Allison moving, you know, give him a passing option, give him a support option. What does Jordan Henderson do? He tries to back heel it 20 yards to Thiago, I think it was, knobs the back heel and gives it straight to, I think, was, was it Patson Dacher or would Jamie Vardy come out at this point? I don't know. He gave it to a Leicester player right on the edge of our box because he tried to back heel it. That was the story of Jordan Henderson's game, trying to be something that he isn't. And the worst one, the worst one, was the goal. Keenan Dewsbury Hall's goal. My captain, you are my captain, Henderson. You are supposed to lead by example. You cannot be shaking tackles in the fourth minute. I don't care if you get booked. I actually don't care. I would appreciate it more if you did. Because all that happened by you shaking that tackle was you put Robertson in the most awful situation of a rock and a hard place. He either tries to follow the run and Iosi Perez is on side because the rest of the high line's up or he tries to play the high line and what happens happens Dewsbury Hall runs through because he's been unchallenged and makes it 1-0 awful from Jordan Henderson right when I thought we could potentially be turning a corner after really good displays at the World Cup this is what we're reintroduced to by Jordan Henderson and it's not on and it just amplifies the midfield problems more Leicester are in the nicest possible way this season crap they're really bad they just got beat 3-0 by Newcastle. And yet we 
got done in the midfield, in a midfield battle once again this year. We have still, still only won one midfield battle all year. One, maybe two if you want to count Aston Villa. But Bournemouth at home, that was the only midfield battle I watched where I went, yeah, we won that. And we still weren't even that good in it. It's a massive, massive, massive problem. And it's got to be sourced out soon. It has to be sourced out soon. If we try and get through this year without buying a midfielder, because, oh, Naby Keita's back soon. Oh, Alex Oxley chain has got a dynamic you can't buy on the market. Oh, Arthur Mello, he's back from injury. He'll be like a new signing. No. Your, inc your incompetence in the market, your desire to wait it out, your desire, your laziness, should we say, has put Liverpool in this position. And it's going to be fine. You can't get away with it now. You have to go into your pocket and you have to take the financial hit to fix the problem you got yourself into. That's it. There is no trying to cheat around it now. You tried to cheat around it for five years. You can't cheat around it anymore. You have to take the financial hit and go big now and fix this midfield. Because otherwise, we could get top four this year because other teams are bad. But any other year, we'd be really, really in a bad situation right now. Really in a bad situation. But that's enough on that. I mean, Thiago was sound. Thiago was boss. Thiago always is boss. I do feel a bit sorry for him because it's like that scene in the end game with Iron Man. You know, he's just on the snap. He's dying. He's, he's, you know, he's shattered. And he just slumps over to the floor. That's what I imagine Thiago's like after every game at the minute because it's a 1v3 in the midfield every single time. But the defence... One man stood out in the defence, and I'll touch on him in a bit. Robertson, knee. I love you, Andy. I do. You know I love you. I love me, Scott. Please, please, please start whipping in crosses. We don't always have to go to the byline. We don't. Sometimes a whipped in cross causes more danger. I don't need you to be touched tight with the byline and then dragging it across the floor. There is more types of crosses. And that game against Leicester, with the runs that Nunes was making... They needed whip crosses in, and we just weren't getting them from Robertson. So um, that's something that I need to see changed, Andy. That's something that I need to see changed. The centre backs, <sighs> Joel Massett was really poor by standards, really poor. I expect much higher when I watch Joel Massett, and I've seen much higher in the past couple year and a half, should I say, for from Joel Massett. But Leicester was a really poor performance from, him. really poor. He was getting bullied by Harvey Barnes every single goal kick. He was getting bullied by Pats and Dacker and then Jamie Vardy. It just wasn't a really impressive John Matic performance. And with Canarse back now, breathing down his neck, he was on the bench against Leicester. I want to see Canarse against Brentford. I do want to see Canarse against Brentford. I can't trust John Matic as much as I can trust Ibu Canarse. So... John Massive had a chance to re earn that starting spot with this run of games, and I don't think he's taking it. Virgil van Dijk has been below standards all season, and the performance against Leicester was no different. It's just, it's not the van Dijk that I'm used to seeing. When I say van Dijk has been below standards, van Dijk below standards is still probably one of the best defend would be about 19 of the team's best defender. But Van Dyke, by the standards I know he can play at, has not been reaching that level this year. And I think that's what's more annoying about it, the fact that I'm not asking for the level of pre-injury Van Dyke. That's sort of like a generational type centre-back performance. I just want the level I saw at the back end of last season, because the back end of last season was very good. But you went away from that, and I thought maybe you were just in your own head about the World Cup and everything. But we'll pass the World Cup. I need you to get out your head, get... Put, take off your Netherlands cap, put on your England, put on your Liverpool cap, not England, Liverpool cap, and go back to the Van Dijk that I know, because we need that Van Dijk if we're to get anything out this season with how bad this midfield is. Alison Becker is just the best. I love the man. I love that man. Amazing goalkeeper, amazing fella, great looking guy. What is not? There's literally zero cons. To Alison Becker, love him. Give him a lifetime contract, that's how much I love that goalkeeper. The attack, Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain is the most pointless thing in the world. Not only for the here and now. In the here and now, he's actually quite bad on the left wing. But we're used to seeing Oxlade-Chamberlain performances 
that are even worse than this in centre mid. So when we watch him in a more natural position on the wing, you go, ooh, this is a good Ox performance. A good Ox performance is probably a really, 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 really bad Jotaro Diaz performance. He was awful again. And this is the issue. Cody Gakpo coming in should solve this, and which is why I'm not expecting to see us change it. But it just brings me back to the point. Jürgen Klopp does not play a system based on his plays. He plays a system based on his beliefs. And what that means is we end up with square pegs in round holes when injuries affect us. Carvalho. I'd rather be, on a personal level, I'd rather Carvalho play because I think, I'm think i thinking in the long term, Fabio Carvalho, if he's on the left, he's going to get game experience. He's going to be playing at, a higher, at the level he needs to be playing at. And... You know, he's playing in the Prem, in a good team. That's what he needs, and he is supposed to be part of our future. So I want to see our future being developed now. I don't want to see Southampton's future. I don't want to see Fulham's future midfielder getting developed in the last six months of his contract. I don't need to see that. What he should be doing is getting graveyard shift minutes when we need to close out wins. Not starting games on the left wing because he's just simply not good enough. And it's sad with Ox because I really liked him in the first year. I really did. But now he's just a shadow of himself and he's doing more harm than good at times. And Leicester was no different, man. Leicester was absolutely no difference. Salah was really poor. Salah was awful. Couldn't take on his man. His finishing was wayward. I, it just, it's just one of those games for Salah, but he was really, really poor. And by the standards I expect of a 350 grand a week player... It just weren't at them levels. Our best attacker was Darwin Nunes. He's always a threat. It is still really quite annoying that he's not finishing his dinner. Because he had, once again, a number of chances which he just couldn't put in the back of the net. But he was also not only our biggest goal threat, our biggest creative threat as well in the game. Darwin Nunes was just chaos. He was chaos, and I don't like to use that word much. Because it implies a bad thing. I prefer he was dangerous at all times. You could not leave him free. You could not let Darwin Nunes go. He was causing that Leicester team so many problems. And he was just un unlucky once again to not get a goal. But I can't keep running with the unluckiness sort of thing. This is now his... I think this was his 19th game for the club. So Brentford tomorrow should be his 20th. Beyond that, I'm going to start judging just a little bit more harshly. Because I'm thinking you'll start to be getting more acclimatised, more adept with the system, understanding the language more, this, that and the other. But my man of the match, Trent Alexander-Arnold. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I've been vocal about Trent Alexander-Arnold this season and my displeasure for certain things that have happened in games regarding him and his performances, i.e. Napoli, Arsenal, Brighton... Any game really at the start of the season. But now he, he's really turned the corner post-World Cup. I thought he was fantastic against Aston Villa from an attacking level. And against Leicester, he was fantastic from a defensive level. Harvey Barnes did not stand a chance against him. Every single time it mattered, Trent Alexander-Arnold won that duel. And that's what I need to see. That's the level that we need to see. Because when he d I've been saying it, Trent Alexander-Arnold is not a bad defender. The narrative that he can't defend is a boring, stupid narrative. And he showed that once again against Leicester. And I just want to see this level remain because, I think I said it in my first preview, if Liverpool were to salvage something from this season, we need a fit and fire on Trent Alexander-Arnold because he's so important. But our, mind you, our best player probably was Wout Fires or however you say his name, Wout Fires, whatever. B-Tech David Luiz, two great finishers for us. But we were so bad, so, so bad. And it doesn't give me much confidence leading in to Brentford. <sighs> because I, re I think Brentford are a really tough team, especially away from home. They grind out results, they work hard. All this, sort, all this stuff that I like to see from teams, Brentford do it in abundance. And Ivan Tony, apparently the injury that he got stretched off with, against West Ham isn't serious so he might be able to play this game which would just about sum up our look considering after our game he's supposed to be getting a ban but 
how would I set up for Brentford? I mean, pff, Cody Gakpo is the only person I'm not going to include because I don't think his work permit will come in in time. So, Allison in goal. Ali in goal. Trent at right back. Ibu and Virgil. There's going to be two centre backs with Costas. I'm going to go Costas. I'm going to go Costas. I think Robertson could just do with another little kick up the arse, another couple of games, which is something that the attack now that we've got Gakpo there can also afford to do. But I digress. Fabinho at DM, back from his first child. Congratulations to the man. Israel Tavares, I think it's called. Fantastic. I need you back at DM, mate, because I can't be doing. I can't be watching Jordan Henderson there again. Right centre mid. Do we do it? Um, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because I think he'll go Henderson. To be honest, I think Jordan Henderson will play. But me personally, I'd go Naby Keita. I'd go Naby Keita because I think he's ready to do 45. And I don't want to make him a sub when we're chasing the game. I'd rather have Naby Keita start, see what we can get to, because I do think, as a right centre mid, he's our best option at the club at the minute. Just We need to try, keep trying to build him up to speed while he's here. Because he, if we're not going to buy, which is the most stupid thing in the world, we're going to need him there. And Thiago at left centre mid, boss, love the man. Left wing, obviously no Cody Gak. If, he's, if he somehow does get a work permit, Cody starts. Because we need to watch a natural left winger. But if there is no Gakpo, I'm going to go Fabio Carvalho. Because as I said, I just want to watch a player who's got a future at Liverpool develop. And make sure that we're utilising him and everything. So we're not stagnating him. Nunes up top. I think this could be the game where the goal drop breaks. It won't be a pretty goal. Don't start thinking it's going to be a fantastic long range effort volley. It may well come off his arse and go in. It'll deflect off two people. He'll shin it in. It won't be pretty, but it's what he needs. Which is why I was so gutted that the Leicester one hit the post and then went in with, off of wildfires. Because that would have been the moment, especially at Anfield. But I think this is a big game for Darwin Nunes and Mo Salah, obviously, off the right. I need to see improvements from Leicester. But it's going to be a tough game. Brentford are just so hard working. I really like Brentford's team. I think they've got one of the best midfields in the league. I do, which is a little bit of an outlandish thing, but I just think the combination of Norgaard, Jensen and De Silva, it's just so well balanced. It fits exactly what Thomas Frank needs his midfielders to do. And considering we can't win a midfield battle at the minute, I'm really worried that they're just going to roll us over in the midfield and it suddenly becomes a really cagey affair. And unlike in previous years, I don't think we win as many KG affairs this year. The big difference, I think the big difference makers though will be the fullbacks. I think especially Trent Alexander-Arnold because he's right, he's now just starting to find his form. And the only way I can see us really getting a result against Brentford, like a comfortable one, is if we utilise the Trent long balls over the top to Nunes. Because that's such a dangerous combination that we just haven't seen enough of yet. And I think up against a back three where the wing backs like to bomb on, the centre backs will spread a little bit wider and the spaces open up. That's where Nunes will thrive. But the only person I back to consistently put them balls into that danger area is Trent. So I would like to see. Uh, I've got hopes on Trent having a really good game. Maybe he could get his first assist of the season against Brentford. But everyone needs to turn up because Brentford are not an easy team. And Ivan Tony does worry me. He's a goal threat. Brian and Buemo, he's got a lot of pace. Pace has just been causing our defence all sorts of problems this year. And the one thing I will say is I don't think Brentford's defence is fantastic, fantastic. But David Raya makes up for that. He's a wonderful goalkeeper. Really come into his own since they got promoted from the Premier League, from the Championship to the Premier League, should I say. So he's a real threat as well. But how, what way am I going to say this game is going to go Ooh, do, 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 do. away from home? Oh, well, I don't know if I can say Liverpool win. We drew 3-3 there last year, which is one of the worst games of the season. I could see it being 2-2, you know. If we win, it's 2-1. If we, it, But I reckon it'll be 2-2. I just... 
Brentford don't change their identity. They don't try and counter team. Like they don't change how they play for other teams. And I think that's going to cause us loads of problems, especially with Ivan Tony's physicality. Them goal kicks are going to be so dangerous when he matches up against Joel Matip and is looking for them on way more flick ons. There's so many aspects of this game where Brentford can hurt us, which is why I can't comfortably say that we'll win. I can see a draw because I think we can cause them problems. But because we're just not that clinical at the minute, I could see it being a game where, let's say, they have five shots and score two. We have 12 and score two. And we miss a couple of big chances and you're kicking yourself at the end of the game. That's how I see it going. But yeah, that's it. Cody Gakpo, love him. Can't wait. Hopefully he plays Simono because if he does, I see it being a 3-1 because you've just got such an unknown quantity on that left who wants to create, wants to cause problems. That could be a big difference maker for us. But Cody... Can't wait to see him. Already ordered me third shirt with his name on the back. That's how confident I am in him. Leicester game. The less said about that one, the better. Just happy with the three points. And Brentford, it's just not going to be easy at all. It's not going to be easy at all. But we just start, we've now won four games in a row. Starting to find a little bit of form. Maybe this is the run that we need to secure top four. And if by some miracle drag ourselves back into a title race but I don't think that'll happen but yeah that's it thank you all for watching make sure you like make sure you comment make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell share it around let people know that I'm back off me fucking three four day bender should we say <laughs> yeah it, it, it sounds a lot more fun than it actually was but hey ho Brentford day after debrief after that and then I'll do a separate video talking about Liverpool's midfield because I think it, it warrants a second video because it's such, it's the key cause of all our problems at the minute. So yeah, thank you all for watching and I'll see you all in a bit.